So I want to ask you, um, now this is all to do with financial crime prevention. That is pretty deep, isn't it? You know, so tell me, how the heck did you get into that? Well, um, as a career, it actually chose me. <laughs> which yeah which is a strange thing. now I, I was working in the public sector uh, for many years actually and at the time and we were dealing with some pretty high level and substantial budgets in the tens of millions basically um and fraud as it was called then uh wasn't something that anyone had paid any attention to um surprisingly enough so one day we got a, a memo co comes down and says oh by the way you guys uh, we're going to do something about fraud and uh, it's going to be you doing it so we were like, uh, OK, um, quite the wrong people to ask, really, in hindsight. Uh, I mean, why give the job of protecting finances to the people that control the finances? Uh, we couldn't actually write checks, but we um, has been uh, controls uh, of finances because it all has to be voted for in Parliament and it's all budgeted and it's all yeah, uh, sure. a case of overmanning being a good thing. Um, so uh, things really just snowballed from there. And being the civil service, um, as soon as you get told you're doing something, first thing they do is send you on a lot of courses. And it started with basic accounting and worked its way up, ended up uh, doing a master's in fraud management uh, and then uh, a doctorate in criminal justice studies. So I made a, a successful career out of crime, really, I suppose. Um, and on the right course, side at the time. On the right side of crime. <laughs> Yes, on the right side, absolutely. Just we didn't realise it at the, at the time, but of course, fraud prevention has become something of a growth industry. Um, mm -hmm. So it's resulted in a lot of changes to the law, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, how we undertake business and even how we, we view our political system. So, yeah, it's been um, quite a journey. That is a that is a massive journey from, from where you started. It's funny how these careers seem to pick us, doesn't it? It's almost as if the universe is picking us for the sorts of jobs that we end up in if we didn't know that already ourselves. Um, so you've had this um, journey. How long has that journey been for you? Oh, gosh. Started? Do, do you really going to give my age away now, aren't I? Probably yeah. the early to mid, but let's say, we'll say the mid 80s till, to the, till, till now, really. Okay, so, so yeah, that's similar 15, to myself, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess, like me, you've seen a lot of change since you first started working in, I mean, computers for starters, but yeah. Well, yeah, I think you just hit the, the, the nail on the head there, because although financial crime hasn't changed, crime, crime doesn't change. Um, it's the same crime. It's how it's facilitated that's changed. So uh, let's take a, a, a fraud that everyone knows, advanced fee fraud, 419 scams. You know, I've got some money in an account. If you give me hundred dollars you can have a 10 million dollars in you know this time next thursday uh today it's perpetrated through emails and texts prior to that it would have been faxes uh before that telephone calls and before the telephone call letters and before that literally by medieval messenger uh, really? yeah uh, advanced fee for frauds are the earliest recorded uh fraud essentially um but the essential fraud's the same pay me something now and I'll give you a reward later. Uh, it, it started off as the Spanish prisoner scam and, you know, you, half of his lordship's castle and, and his kingdom and his firstborn goat and everything just for um, you know, a few hundred doubloons now um, and right up to what we do today. Um, but a fraud is, is, is a theft, but it's couched within a lie or, or with untruths. Um, I, I tell you a lie and as a result of that, you give me some money. That, yeah. That's what a fraud is. Yeah. And the challenge really is to respond to the method of perpetration. And, and you're absolutely right. What was once cash or a promissory note became a check, then a bank transfer. And, and now it's just as likely to involve a Bitcoin transfer. I was going to say um, Bitcoin and cyber stuff must be on your radar. Yeah, there, right? Absolutely. And of course, it's not always cash. It's, it was, you know, as you know, it's sometimes it's information that people want that's going to lead to cash later. Yeah. They get the information fraudulently. And that's the fraud. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we, we see enough of these um, detective and uh, kind of TV shows around kind of fraud and, uh, you know, what's happening to try and manipulate the system. Right. So I think even, you know, we're not experts in it, but we can understand and follow what you're saying. Um, so what's your been, been your biggest challenge in, in fighting this, you know, this crime? I don't know what, yeah, I, 
spot it. I would say the attitude from those at the top, those in power. Uh, it was only, mm -hmm. what, a month, two months ago, a, a prominent politician stood up and said, oh, fraud's not something that ordinary people care about. So that's why we didn't include it on the crime stats we've just released. Um, now, that really annoyed me because uh, it's not only an inherently untrue, it's perpetrating that ridiculous lie, that old lie that fraud is a victimless crime. It's not. That's never been the case. Financial crime destroys lives. And that's the serious part of my job, really, I guess. It obliterates life savings. It destroys jobs. It causes companies to go bust. Uh, it causes immense psychological and mental health problems on its victims. Mm. Uh, in short, fraud kills. And the biggest challenge, therefore, uh, for myself and others in the industry is the battle to keep it a priority and to see it secure that adequate funding in terms of prevention, detection and sanction. That's that's the biggest challenge, I think, for me. I mean, you say the people at the top um, are kind of a dismissive of it or not taking it you know, as seriously as possible. Is it just all too difficult for them to get hold of? Is that is that the apathy that you're seeing? Um, that, yeah, I think it's a two edged sword, I think. And I'm going to be controversial here. Yes, it's seen as being too complicated. It really isn't any more complicated than most crimes, really. Yeah. Um, it's expensive to investigate for various reasons um, and it can get a bit muddly. But I think also um, it's the old power corrupts things uh, adage. And I think people are scared of it because it's very easy to become a fraudster because you get swept along with things, you believe your own power. I mean, that's what my thesis was about. It was about how people get the power and they believe that they can do anything. And I think some people at the top are almost running scared uh, or they're actually already doing it. <laughs> uh, and they're frightened of, of being swept along with it and because it's not understood. Um, you know, murder is murder. You know, I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to go. I don't go out in the morning to kill someone. I don't go out in the morning to defraud someone. But it's a lot easier to end, a, end the day having committed a fraud than it is having end the day committing a murder. They're very different routes to get into. And I think that's probably an issue. Sounds like you've got a screenplay in there somewhere. You know, you've got a, a TV show or a film about yeah. some kind of, you know. I think, um, so. I think so. Deep fraud that uh, you've unearthed. I'm sure you've got those sort of stories. Somebody ought to come and pick your brains about that. Um, but um, what's, the, what's the biggest positive change that you've seen um, in terms of, how fraud is handled now and, 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 and what, what does that look like in 2020? Well for, well, for me, the biggest change, certainly in the UK, which is where the majority of my work takes place, was the Fraud Act 2006. Uh, that was the first time fraud as fraud became a crime on the statute books in the UK. Really? 2006? That's not... Yeah, uh, there was a conspiracy <laughs> to commit fraud. There was obtaining a pecuniary advantage by deception and various other charges, but actually fraud, there wasn't a, even a legal definition, really. And it, it also legislated to make uh, even the exposure of risk to fraud a crime. Yeah. Now, you don't, act, you don't actually have to have had a loss uh, to secure a conviction which is incredibly powerful. And it's so important because once the money's gone, of course, the money's gone. And the problem with fraud is um, it's the loss as much as anything, isn't it? it you know, that, that, that is the centre of the crime. And if you've lost your life savings and they've gone for good, the fact that, that Charlie's banged up in Chokey for you know, the next 20 years is of no consequence. You've got no pension now. You've had to sell your house. That's not coming back. So... Once the money's gone, as I say, it's too late for the victim and we need to stop the fraud and get a conviction before that's happened. And that's what allowed us to do that. I mean, equivalent legislation exists in other jurisdictions. So I would say that that has helped the fight against financial crime so much more and made it so much more effective in terms of uh, uh, criminal sanctions, that sort of thing. And that, that and the Proceeds of Crime Act, of course, which gives you the ability to seize funds if you, you haven't got an adequate um, explanation of where you got them from. That, that, yeah. That's pretty nice. Very powerful. So, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the legislation that's come in has made things a lot, a lot easier and a lot better for the victims as well. Yeah. I mean, we have done some of that work as enforcement professionals in terms of, of uh, proceeds of crime. And, and one of the things that always staggers me about that is that people will say, oh, well, 
um, if you do this, if you take this person's house or if you, you know, go into this person's house and take their goods, then um, there would, could be repercussions. And <clears throat> that is, you know, I think that's the sinister side of fraud, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that it's, a, it's an underground activity with people, dubious people running it. And therefore, you know, I mean, we when we go in, we're going under a court order. Um, so no one is above the law, right? Um, yeah. But um, I, I imagine that for people running businesses, um, I don't know what level, you can tell me, but what level of size of business you can be defrauded. I, I guess it's any size of business, but it must, yeah. be, it must be scary to uncover a fraud in your business and then try and call in the police. Is that what you do? You ring the police and how do you alert the authorities that there's been a fraud? How does that work? Yeah, it's exactly it. Well, uh, then, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you haven't got a plan before it happens, um, I liken it to a fire in many ways. If you didn't have fire exits and a fire response plan, a fire extinguishers and fire marshals in your company, you didn't wait or you waited until the first fire before you realised, oh, perhaps I should have got some of that. That's what fraud's like. Yeah, but yeah. we don't have a lot of companies, even big ones, don't have that risk. They don't have the fire extinguishers in place. So they don't have the exit plans. And of course, the the fire that is broad just burn, literally burns figuratively burns the business down. So they're not anticipating a fraud, and no. therefore they're not risk assessing for it, and then no. they've got gaps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and that's you know really why we wanted you to come on today and and explain that to um, or, or at least highlight that that risk to businesses so that they can yeah. contact you and and find out how they can plug those gaps. Right. Um, so on that theme, then, I mean, if a business owner um, uh, or, or a group of directors, you know, board of directors had to, to sort of do one thing to protect themselves, what would be your what would be your magic bullet? Um, in a word, awareness. Uh, carry out regular awareness training for yourself, uh, your staff, as you say, the board, um, your staff are your eyes and ears um, of, of your organisation and for you. Uh, they're also your first line of defence, of course. So if they know what to look for, how to respond, uh, then you've got the best defence possible. Now, statistically, um, over 50 percent of fraud is uncovered by staff at all levels, but by staff. So if they're not trained, then you'll risk not detecting half the frauds attempts that are made against you, at least until it's too late. And it also ensures you set the right tone for an organisation. It goes back to my earlier point about yeah. tone from the top. Yeah. Um, and that's got the additional benefit of protecting you against the big, your, the biggest threat as well. Of course, the biggest threat for you is are your staff, is your staff. Um, it's sad, uh, but it's understandable. It's easy for someone within your organisation or within your zone of influence, as it were, to defraud you because they've got access to the premises already. They've got knowledge of your IT systems, your procedures and your processes. If they know that you take it seriously and you'll do something about it and there's a plan in place, then they're going to be incredibly less likely to even attempt to defraud you as well. So awareness throughout the company has two effects, protects you from the outside and the inside, and it gives you that line of defence that you wouldn't otherwise have. So yeah. it's vital, yeah. It's um, it's a it's a sad fact that you you know you do have to be so aware of of, of who you are working with um, in your team, um, and your you know you could be a, a smallish team um, or an extended team, um, but um, a wide ranging you know company. Um, uh, but background checks on staff and, and, and doing, you know, due diligence on hiring staff, I think. Yeah. And, and, and I think for people that are listening to this and they go, well, you know, what are you talking about? I don't do anything naughty. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good girl or boy or whatever. The fact is, is that it's not about you. It's about protecting the organisation. And if you want to be a team player, then you've got to submit yourself to those checks, haven't you? Absolutely. You've got to be I mean, particularly, yeah, particularly the financial services, but generally uh, more and more across businesses now that have a, adopt a very robust know your customer policy where they do background checks, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. and to a, le a lesser or greater extent with business partners. But how many people have a know your staff policy? Mm. We take people on based on their CV, which we may give a cursory glance to, have one interview perhaps, 
yeah. they, they look a decent chap i could i could see myself you know having a drink after work with them and etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah you've got your job's yours congratulations who are they yeah what's their background it just doesn't happen as much as it should but no there you go. that's no well i mean we work in the you know one of our, our solutions is legal and so under that solution we're under the solicitors regulation authority and um of course we are we are checking clients for mm. anti-money laundering um, um quite deeply in terms of who we're contracting with for services but um i mean touch wood we've been lucky with our staff but um, in other parts of Share Group, we have to check background check security officers, as you would expect. Um, no. uh, more so in the UK than in the US at the moment, although I'm sure that will change in due course. But it's um, it is it is interesting that we we could be missing part. You know, a gap could be in our organisations on fraud just because we are not taking that step in terms of background no. checking and our staff. And to be a team player, I think you need to submit yourself to that scrutiny. But is, is there such a thing as a typical fraudster? I mean, I bet you see all sorts. Yes, they look just like this. Uh, no. No, <laughs> no I don't think you okay. say so, yeah. <laughs> The statistics will tell you that the average fraudster is uh, a member of staff, mostly middle management sort of level, uh, male, of course. He'll be 45 to 55, which cuts me out, but I'm not saying which, age, which end of the age bracket that is. Um, been with the organisation something like five to ten years. There'll be nothing special in terms of performance, but they won't be underperforming. Um, in reality, if you want to know what a typical fraudster looks like, then after this interview or when you finish watching this um, recording, go out into the street, your nearest town or city or village, and just make a note of everyone that walks past because that's what they look like. They look like ordinary people. Um, well, you'll be able to not... narrow it down then. <laughs> well, that's what I'm coming to. The thing that you can look at is their behaviors and not what they're like now when they change because when people do something naughty they change their behavior and that's what you look for you're looking for changes in habits and there are certain things you can look at like suddenly not taking holiday uh suddenly keeping long hours um maybe disappearing occasionally during the day all the various things you could look for that they never did before uh because it's if somebody joins your company, if you're talking about staff, they don't come in on day one and go, right, where can I get some fraud? They oh, start with an ordinary job and then yeah. something will trigger it. It's about motive. And that's my thing. Motivation, motivators is what I'm, I'm all about, really. And the fraud triangle, which is a bit like the fire triangle with fuel and oxygen and, and, and heat energy. But the fraud triangle, you have the three sides of opportunity, pressure and rationalisation. And those three things need to be in place. Obviously, as a company, the only thing you can really control is the opportunity, but you can do something about the others as well. If you want to, I can help you with those. Um, so one of the things I use is a tool called the mo uh, Motivational Mapping, which is an amazing tool that identifies individuals' motivators. And it gives a great overview of your staff uh, and gives you the power to be able to appeal to them as individuals and a team in a way that, as I say, appeals directly to their personal motivators. It's a very powerful ma ma um, management investigative and coaching resource. So look at the people, what, what fires them up uh, and look at their behaviours. So in that sense, yes, you can. there is no such thing as a typical fraudster, but that doesn't mean you can't identify somebody who may be in the zone, should we say. Yeah, in the so zone. that's of a real help. Mm. Yes, that, that's definitely true. I mean, is it about them being, I mean, I guess they cover their tracks. I mean, is it about them being less than honest, less than truthful, or is it is it something more than that? I mean, they, they, if, they're, if they're clever, they'll be trying to cover their tracks, won't they? Yeah, um, but by being clever and covering their tracks, therein lies an indicator of, of their activities. It's a bit like uh, a murder where somebody's forensically aware. The fact that they're forensically aware tells you a little bit about their background. So even if they don't leave fingerprints and footprints and things like that, uh, and you detect that somebody's doing this, it helps you narrow down what's going on. So it's a little bit like that. So if people are covering their tracks, I remember when I started out, gosh, 
probably when I first started work, you know, um, and we were looking at some accounts and we uh, we gave it, wherever, wherever it was, I think it was a, a, a high street bank in the UK, my first job, it was probably with them. And we we're being shown the handwritten accounts that have been kept, um, not at the time, not, not that quite that old, but they were showing you these old things. And uh, I think somebody commented on how scruffy they were. They expected in the old days to be all lovely handwriting. So oh, now yeah. he said one of the one of the biggest indicators of falsified accounts is perfectly kept accounts, because people would do all the stuff in pencil and siphon off their bit and then write it beautifully in the ledger. Oh. So if you saw a beautifully set kept of accounts, you sent the bank inspectors into that branch because you knew something was up. There you go. So that, so, yeah. So yeah. sometimes they're too clever and they're covering themselves too much. Yeah, uh, but yeah. I, I, the dog in the yeah, the curious incident with the dog in the night. Mm. But you you mentioned motivational mapping. I I, I saw from your LinkedIn profile because you've got a great uh, profile on LinkedIn. I actually saw that we're University of London alumni. So um, I was there in um, in 1983. So I don't want to date you, but um, I I did my law degree there. Um, oh, fantastic! But. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, from the point of view of, um, I've forgotten what I was going to ask you now. What was I asking you? <laughs> um, that's a good thing on a, on, a, on a talk show thing, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Um, but, well, let me ask you this. Um, oh, no, motivational mapping. That's what I was going to yes. ask you. Yes. So motivational mapping. I mean, you're one of under 800 people in the world that can do yeah. motivational mapping. And, it, and I, I'm... I have actually had um, myself mapped by um, one of your uh, one of our mutual uh, contacts. So, um, but for you, I mean, how do you think that lends itself to helping solve this dilemma of identifying fraud in business? Is it you know what's that tool going to do? Two things. It works on the individual basis in that if you suspect someone, um, or say you suspect someone, you understand someone even before you suspect. If you understand what motivates them, and if somebody comes up who is um, perhaps something like a builder, which you will know what that is. So if you don't know what that is, contact me and, and arrange a map. <laughs> um, but one of the things that build, appeals to the builder in terms of motivator is cash, money. So if you know someone's a builder, then I'm not saying you then watch what they're doing, but you know that you to appeal to them, to keep them positively motivated, you appeal to that. Whereas someone else who's perhaps more of um, a spirit type person, is more interested in what their job is bringing to other people and how it's helping the world. You appeal to that. Um, but the, the strength of it when it comes to counter-fraud counter work is that it helps you build a very positively motivated team. Now, a really positively motivated team will do anything for each other. It's, I mean, I'm going to be, be perfectly honest with you, a, a proper motivated supportive team is what sent guys over the top in first world war they didn't do it for king or country they did it because they had a team that was supporting each other to right. this day in the military if you have a unit that is very supportive like that they will you you, you can take them anywhere and do anything yeah. in the most extreme yeah. the yeah. same thing applies in an office factory shop so if you get the motivators and they're all motivated they ain't going to want to dump on their mates basically so they will be more or so we say more positive at work and so much less um, uh, sort of, I don't know, motivated yeah. <laughs> to go off the, the path because fraudsters work on their own. So if you've got a good motivated team, there's not going to be a fraudster in it. There's no room or, for a fraudster. There's no room. and they, they'll, they'll, be, they'll stand out a mile. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it works on two bases. And I think the second is the, power, the most powerful one when it comes to building an, an anti-fraud environment and a, and a positive team, definitely. And in terms of your multi and using this tool to basically help you um, build, you know, the the protections that organisations need, um, you run a consultancy now for multi motivational mapping, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Is that Adstral? How do you pronounce that? Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Ad Astral Consulting uh, Limited. Ad yeah. 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 So that's it's a, it's a large part. It's become quite a large part of the business. Mm. That's, that's sort of almost now almost now a, not exactly a separate issue because it's got so many legs that are, you know and possibilities in terms of business and and, and people management but uh, yeah it started off as a tool alongside things like my statement analysis um work which yeah it's it is really powerful um, and is that and is that a uk centric business or is that something you can take you know across jurisdictions 
oh gosh, yeah, yeah uh, across jurisdictions. Um, yeah. I tend to, it depends on what I'm doing, but um, I, if it's English speaking, I can go myself anyway. And my, my French is a little, you know. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, but um, yeah, pretty much most things transfer. There are some uh, differences in terms of cultures. Uh, what I do when I, depending on what the, the role is, what I would do um, quite often is I, I have contacts and I, I've got um, people that I can use in other countries that know the lay of the land, etc. So, I mean, I don't do this sort of thing anymore. But in a previous life, when I used to do uh, corporate uh, investigations I was, uh, with another company, um, we would use local people um, to do a lot yeah. of the work. Yeah. So if it's surveillance, for instance, there's no way I'm going to go to, I don't know, Singapore and do surveillance or um, you know, the, say the Caribbean. I would I would have to employ someone over there because I would stick out like a sore thumb. You know, there he is, six foot something tall with his size nine boots. And <laughs> but isn't the art of it? <clears throat> I mean, I'm interested in this because um, I'm interested in uh, companies and, and businesses that can work. Um, um, you know, through through technology, can work anywhere in the world. Language and culture, as, you know, as as important elements of that. And of course, one has to cater for that. But, I mean, that's mm-hmm. certainly Share Group's journey is to is is not to be limited to the shores of the UK. Yeah. You know, Blighty being home always, but or you know, always pushing the borders out for Share Group. And um, it's great to to hear that your business is doing the same. I had another business owner last week doing the same thing. And I, I just think that this just gives us so much scope. And yeah, of course, we do have to cater for, for different things. But that's yeah. all the um, the ingenuity, isn't it, that you bring to your business model in terms of facilitating different language, different culture, but still being able to deliver that that baseline service, which will, will I, I guess, um, so, sort out fraud anywhere in the world. Yeah, well, it has to. Criminals don't have barriers. They don't have borders. No, exactly. You know, I, I, if, I, if a client engages me in London and um, all of a sudden I find out that some money's gone to Italy or Australia or the US yeah. or wherever, I can't just say, sorry, mate, I don't go south of the river. Um, you know, you have to get someone else. I have to follow the money wherever it goes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. There is no, it's really funny in a way. So do you work abroad? I work on the planet Earth at the moment, and that's only because humans haven't colonised Mars, colonised Mars yet. Then I'll be working on Mars and Earth. So, yeah, the criminals will go where the money is. You've got to go where the criminals go. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I'm all for it. I think it's, um, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, fantastic that UK and US companies are in demand to to deliver these types of services outside of their own shores. Of course, there are other countries as well, but. Of course, the common denominator here is language, um, yeah. and uh, we shouldn't underestimate the. Uh, it, it, it's funny actually you should say that because uh, a little while ago I had a case uh, that started off in Exeter in uh, Devon in yeah. the UK, yeah, and ended up seizing a house in Florida, and yeah. a boat over there. So, and that was just a couple of uh, op- sort of office workers basically who worked for a, a major company over here. Um, and it's as I say, it started with a, 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 a funny enough, it started with some awareness training. I trained right. some t- people down there, and as always happens, within a couple of weeks, the phone goes, and, Oh, is that David? Yeah, you were down here giving a talk, yeah, and I know what's coming next. I found a couple of suspicious transactions. I said, Okay, right, well, which systems it on? Tap, tap, tap. Okay, leave it with me. Got onto my IT people. Said, can I can I have a dump of all the payments? This is these are the criteria. Can you send me it? within an hour? I got a spreadsheet uh, with thousands of wow. transactions on there. Did a little bit of digging around and a bit of backwards engineering, as I call it. And by the by the end of the day, I think I had about three hundred thousand pounds of suspicious transactions. Eight hundred thousand pounds worth that they got out in five months. You, with controls in place, but the controls had a floor limit. And they all of these payments were like five pounds under the two thousand five hundred floor, floor limit. limit. Right. Um, yeah. And as I say, it ended up in Florida in the end. So you know, you can't stop you can't stop at the lizard point and say, sorry, it's across the other side of the pond. No, just want to make sure that we understand that not all fraudsters come to Florida. They could go anywhere in the world. <laughs> it's just um, it just it just the way yeah, we were speaking about something you thought, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I suppose if you wanna you want to get to sunny climes then this is a popular place it's a lovely place to go if i, if I was defrauding you know <laughs> yeah I think, I think yeah it's a it's a busy place number one place in the us at the moment to move to 
I so, think so. Um, near, near the Caribbean as well. So yeah, everyone, everyone go to Montana. There's plenty of room up there. So don't come down here. We're getting crowded. <laughs> um, okay, so well, that's uh, that's fascinating. Now, um, I suppose just to sum up, then, I mean, um, what, what what aspects of work do you prefer? I mean, is it was it prevention, detection, or recovery, or sanctions? Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Well, they've all got their pluses and their minuses, I suppose. Um, they can be frustrating. It'll be frustrating in a way. Recovery and sanctions is rewarding, definitely. Yeah. Uh, seeing someone, you know, marched off, getting uh, handing a check over to someone, here's your pension money back. Fantastic. Um, that's fantastic. the spirit in me. Yeah. 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 Um, getting a good result. That's great. Seeing the perpetrator brought to book. But it is difficult sometimes to find and recover those losses because money can disappear. Um, We know where it's gone, but it's once it's been transferred into something else, it's very difficult, particularly if it's gone abroad in certain jurisdictions. And of course, by then it's too late, quote unquote. Uh, Detection is really interesting. It appeals to my love of solving puzzles. Uh, goes back to childhood watching, you know, Z cars and Dixon and Dot Green and things like that. And, you know, always yeah. wanted to be a copper sort of thing. Um, but it can be an incredibly tedious and slow process. It's not all as exciting as Inspector Morse and, and Poirot and Miss Marvel and all that sort of stuff. Uh, very few poisonings in fraud, um, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> but it is satisfying. Yeah, it's it's very hard work, but it is a science which appeals to the scientist in me. And you need to be evidence led. It's uh, yeah. real investigation is not, as I say, it's not an exciting TV movie or drama. It's hard graft. I suppose if I'm really, really going to say what do I enjoy the most when I do it and I know I'm going to enjoy it. I know it's not going to be tedious. I know it's, you know, I know I'm going to get a result. It's the um, prevention side, which probably surprises most people. But nobody's been affected yet. Uh, well, I said, sometimes I get called in after they have. but. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different story. It involves meeting a lot of new people, which I love. It involves presenting and training, which are, are passions of mine. Uh, I call it my stand-up routine. Um, as you know, I like to keep my training sessions very lively and very um, very yeah. enjoyable and fun. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to with fraud sometimes. I was going to say with fraud. <laughs> yeah. You're quite unique. It, <laughs> it can become quite negative, quite scary, and delivered in the wrong way. I've been to some fraud things, and I've thought, oh, Goodness, you're making this so boring. Um, I also like working with boards. Uh, that is that is great as well. And management teams to put the policy documents in place yeah. uh, and the response plan and doing the fraud risk assessments. Um, and I always ensure I have I, I leave having built a strong uh, organisation or helped build a strong organisation that are aware of the risks and have a robust defence uh, in place. And I walk away and I've got all aspects. I've had the fun. I've had fun. I've got a result um I've, I've made improvements and um you know people go away happy which is which is what it's all about whereas yeah yeah so i suppose yeah that that's my answer it'll be the prevention side of things really which is and, strange. And very satisfying that. isn't it i mean that must yeah. be very satisfying in, in the role so thank you for sharing that now um, i did say at the beginning of the interview i was going to ask you about doctor <laughs> who because um so just tell me a little bit a little or for all us Whovians, just give us a little morsel of, you know, trivia that you want to share with us. A little bit of trivia. Oh, I could tell you so much. When I when I was younger, I really got into Doctor Who and joined the Appreciation Society. So I, I was a fan alongside Peter Capaldi, for instance, at conventions okay. and okay. things like that. I bought. I once bought jo, uh, John Pertwee of Vodka and Tonic in, in a oh. hotel, had a chat with him. He was an amazing guy, John Pertwee. He was lovely. Um, I met all bar William Hartnell, the old doctors, lots of the companions, absolutely lovely people. Um, so, and yes, I've got a long scarf. I've still got it. I don't wear it anymore. Um, but yeah, what can I tell you about Doctor Who? Gosh, um, I think it's it's one of those things that it's gone beyond the TV program now. It's now part of our culture. It's like Sherlock Holmes and and, and Miss Marple. It's 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 like um, Robin Hood. It's it's part of our makeup, and I think it's it's just woven socially into into British society, and of course across the world now. You know, it's it's what Absolutely. millions, hundreds of millions of viewers around the world, yeah, uh, eagerly tuning British. in. Yeah, yeah, great British but, export. It is. It's very British, and yet it's at the same time it's not. It's it's really. It's everything to everyone, isn't it? Everyone's got their favourite doctor. Everyone's got the doctor they don't like, their favourite monster, the monster they don't like. They've got their favourite, you know. It, everyone says it's not as good as, you know, I'm a 
Tom Baker was my doctor, John Pertry, Tom Baker, although I, mem- I do remember Patrick Crown. Um, and then, of course, the others came along and I'd grown up and the, the child in me sort of gets it gets squashed down, doesn't it, a little bit. And and I don't think it's good. And then, but I meet people that think Sylvester McCoy is the best thing. I meet people that think that, you know, the, the, uh, Jodie Whittaker and, and, and all sorts. Mm-hmm. And, and I look at it and I look at little kids and I look at them now and I just, and it brings a tear to my eye because I remember being there on Saturday afternoon, not quite hiding behind the settee, but, you know, eager, waiting for, you know, when that, music well it was usually grandstand music or, or world of sport with yeah, my dad and my right. brother yeah yeah because you know, i was not into sport then you'd sit there again it'd be like yeah. in a minute in a minute oh no it's the news oh it's basil brush or oh, it's whatever yeah. it was and then it would come <laughs> on for 25 minutes you were transported somewhere amazing and then when the, the theme music kicked in at the end it was like i, I just want to get next week out the way <laughs> I mean, I know, you don't get that I, anymore, do we? we? We binge watch now. We watch the entire series of Game of Thrones in you know three weekends, and it's just. <laughs> well, I like both. I mean, I, I, you know, I could reminisce. My dad got me into all of that. You know, he was a be- great Doctor Who fan. I spent most of my time oh, behind the settee when the yes <laughs> was on. You know, um, and um, um, but he loved Star Trek as well. But um, yeah. I, my favourite Doctor Who is Matt Smith, who um, oh, right. met with um, Amelia Pond when they ate yeah. fish fingers and custard. Yeah, I must um, admit, I love Matt Smith as well. He was just otherworldly and similar to Tom Baker. You, yeah. You, if, if somebody said there were two Doctor Who's, uh, we're going to reveal the secret now, two of the actors that played Doctor Who actually were aliens, which two would it be? It'd probably pick Matt Smith and Tom Baker, wouldn't it? <laughs> I see he's rocking up in uh, the Game of Thrones prequel, isn't he, Matt Smith? Is he? Oh, gosh. Yeah. So he's going to be a, um, one of the dragon family. So, um, yeah. So, well, that's it. That's fantastic that you, you know, you've got this um, lighter side of life. <laughs> to, to, to the day you have job. to. You have to. <laughs> I think that's great. Well, listen, um, I, thank you so much for, um, for for being on the sofa today. Um, you're, welcome. you're welcome. Your company um, website, Ad Astro Consulting, that will be in the show notes. So oh, um, if anybody picks up on this video, um, and you can obviously share it on your own channels. Um, and then you've got your personal coaching website at davidrjeffries.com. So yes. again, I'd yep. encourage people to to follow you, find you on LinkedIn. I found you today easily enough um, and just connect with you and, uh, you know, for all things to do with fraud prevention um, yep. and, um, and motivational mapping and Doctor Who. Absolutely. I hope you get some Whovian fans after all of this. <laughs> so um, anyway, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about what, what is a bit of a dry old subject if it's not your thing right um but it's necessary to to introduce you to people like david so that you can um really think about that in your own organization um, and that's what this whole show on the sofa um series is about is about your business and introducing people to you that can help you um solve some of the dilemmas that you face as business owners um, and if you're interested in uh, learning more about Share Group, you can visit our website at sharegroup.com. Uh, we're, we've got our own Facebook channel, you know, every channel that we can, we're operating on really to bring you news and views from Share Group um, and our terrific community. So, David, thank you so much for your time today. Um, okay. And um, I say, come and see us again in the future when you've got a great case study to share, perhaps, um, on how you put the world to right and, you know, Got save the universe. Save the universe. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Sonic, my sonic screwdriver. <laughs> there you go. Sonic screwdriver. All you Whovian fans. I'm going to put that in the show notes because that's a key word. <laughs> trying to get some, some people looking at this uh, pot, uh, this uh, video. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my, if my son was here, he'd know what exactly. What one is that one? Yeah. I got that one for you because that's Matt Smith's one. All right. As you can tell, I'm not that much of a human fan. I would know the sonic screwdriver. All right. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank, Thank you, you, Claire. Bye.